It's a wonderful thought that after 60 years that I can introduce the man who started it all. And it isn't often in a man's lifetime that he can see the fruits of his early work still growing, still maturing, still becoming stronger and stronger. 60 years ago in this country, was totally different to today. Children lived under much rougher circumstances. Poverty was widespread. Pennies were very, very difficult to come by. But never mind, you don't want that from me, you want it straight from the horse's mouth. But it gives me terrific pleasure, and I mean that, to introduce our Dr. Leslie Paul, our original Little Otter, of the Woodcraft folk. Thank you, Teddy. You know, the first thing that occurs to me in talking about the early days of the Woodcraft folk is to say how small we were in those early beginnings. We had, what, four or five boys to begin with, plus myself, plus Sidney Shaw, woodpecker, who was probably forgotten by at least the younger members, but who was a great standby in those early days of the woodcraft folk. And then, uh, six months later, we had perhaps another five or six girls, and we were about a dozen, a round dozen or a little more. Now, that is a very tiny beginning. And where did they come from? The boys uh, came from the Co-op Junior Guild, so that they were really, as it were, captured by the Co-op movement, and we were poaching the Junior Guild, and the girls much the same. Um, and of course, we had no money. We got two or three pounds out of the Royal Arsenal Cooperative Society to get tents for the very first camps. 9th of May, 1925. Dear Mr. Paul, I have pleasure in informing you that my committee have decided to make a grant of five pounds for camping equipment for the Wayfarers Fellowship. They make this grant on condition that all camping equipment purchased out of this grant remains the property of the department. I enclose herewith a letter which if presented to Mr. Ben, furnishing manager at Woolwich, will make it possible to purchase the goods through our cooperative agency. Yours fraternally, Joe Reeves, Secretary, Education Department. The real beginning was not just the Wayfarers Fellowship, which still goes on, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The Wayfarers Fellowship, but another thing called the Mossback Lodge. I got together a group of young friends, and we met um, sitting on kitchen chairs in my back garden, or my mother's back garden at Burville Road in 
on Rope Park and we discussed, as it were, the setting up of a training group for leaders of future groups. And um, I suppose even when we did get those groups founded at the end of 1925, we were, as I say, not much more than 70 young people strong. So that we, you could say that we were small, young, penniless, insignificant. Um, as Teddy said, pennies were short. More than pennies were even shorter. I remember that on the day the R101 went down uh, in France, a very wet November morning, as I recall, we were meeting in the house of Joe Reeves, if I hope his name means something to you still, a very fervent supporter of the Woodcraft folk and, of course, the education secretary of the RACS, and a great supporter. And we met at this house to set up a 50-pound fund we didn't even get it. Perhaps another thing should be said also about that very early movement, that it was uh, entirely established by the young people themselves, even if supported by the RACS. Because there wasn't one of us at that meeting in my back garden who was over 21. All were youngsters, as it were, in the first phase of really and truly their careers, and very different they were. Sidney Shaw was a, became a tram conductor. My brother was a clerk in, in Westminster Bank. Jack Brown was a plumber. See, the, these were young working people coming together to found their own movement. They weren't founded by somebody else, by the co-op or, 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 or by the church or something like that. It was, as they say in Latin, sui generis self-founding organization. And my goodness, it gave the cooperative movement a headache for almost ever after. They couldn't see what exactly was the point of a movement which ran itself instead of being run from Holyoke House in Manchester. We were part of a quite significant agitation among young people at the end of the First World War, which the historians call the Great War. Our brothers and fathers, many of them had been killed. So we were, as it were, the survivors, and um, we were now deeply troubled as a generation about the consequences and events of the First World War. But um, what happened was this, that in, in a sense of this revulsion, against the, uh, all the slaughter and misery of the First World War, produced in us a, a critique uh, and even an embarrassment with the, about the scout movement of which we had been part. Because no question about it, if you look through Scouting for Boys or any of the other, other um, um, publications of the scout movement, it was paramilitary in the sense it was prepared to turn its boys or train its boys for future service in the armed forces, and it was imperialist. Imperialist not necessarily in the worst possible sense, because we had a great empire then, and the defense of it seemed a very logical thing to most young people. But we were against now imperialism and against paramilitarism. So Ben Powell's contribution really came in the scouts through Mafeking and through the Boy Scouts that were organized there to help the military during that long siege. And so his scouting ideas came mostly from, as it were, a military basis or a military origin. But there was another source, and that source was from Ed, Edward Thompson Seton, an American naturalist who wrote some very fine books, nature books, for young people. And he had founded in the United States the American Woodcraft Indians. And this American Woodcraft Indians was as dotty on Red Indianism as, uh, shall I say, Baden-Powell was dotty on military scouts. And it produced, uh, he produced an enormous book of woodcraft, which I think is unreadable, but it's full of marvelous drawings. And these uh, New York boys, slum boys in the 
in the Woodcraft Indians had to dress almost exactly as Indians and do all the things that Indians do. Now, of course, he, how could he be popular in the United States when they were still, as it were, celebrating the massacre of Indians? So his movement remained very small. But you certainly couldn't do anything in it unless you did it in a Red Indian style, so that even a sheath knife had to have its beautiful fringe um, on the sheath, sheath knife case, on the sheath. So now I ought to speak a little bit about Kibokieft. One of the great men thrown up by the scout movement, great but dotty, was John Hargrave, who founded an organization called the Kibokieft Kindred. Now he was what? He started as a boy working for Arthur Pearsons, the um, publishers of Scouting for Boys. And then he became so keen in the scout movement that he was writing a weekly Woodcraft article, Woodcraft article for the Scouter. That's, no, the Scout. That's when I first met him and read his stuff. Now they thought so much of him that when he came back, invalided from Gallipoli, during the war, they made him headquarters commissioner of scouting and woodcraft. So now two influences came to bear upon particularly John Hagre, who had his, had his military day with the scouts and now was having his Seton day with the scouts and was more and more uh, pressing for a movement which was a scout movement which was woodcraft and not paramilitary. And he succeeded, but only succeeded after they checked him out. So he also criticized the scout movement for being undemocratic. But the Boy Scout movement was incorporated by royal charter. It still is. And the royal charter means that the governing body can uh, reappoint its successors. And so when he began to press all these things as headquarters uh, commissioner, they jolly well couldn't bear it. And they threw him out, you see. And so he retorted to being thrown out by founding this new organization called the Kibbo Kift Kindred. The message of Kibbo Kift to the Boy Scout movement. In November I told you that there are certain things which are throttling the progress of the Boy Scout movement. Let me repeat what those things are. One, the handbook Scouting for Boys is out of date. Its intense and somewhat narrow patriotic catchwords may have suited 1908, but certain little incidents have taken place since then. I remember that there was a war. Two, the Royal Charter. Three, a non-representative form of government at your HQ. For having written that article, I was excommunicated from the Boy Scout movement. That was the only answer that was given to that article. It was, and still is, unanswerable. The Scout movement ought to have been a world peace movement, and it ought not to be connected in any way whatsoever with armies or navies. The religious policy of your movement has already led you on the rocks. It ought to have blazed a clean new trail along the lines of world worship of one great God of all mankind. Peace be with you, and may the hunting be good hunting. How, John Hargrave. But a lot of left chaps, radicals, socialists, cooperators, seized upon KKK as an opportunity to create a mass movement of boys and girls away from the scouts and the brigades. And foremost among these organizations was the Royal Arsenal Cooperative Society, which then, as I remember, was directly affiliated to the Labour Party and uh, not through the Cooperative Party, and therefore was perhaps more socialist than the rest of the cooperative movement. And the Royal Arsenal Cooperative Society Education Committee, led by Joe Reeve, founded some six or seven KKK tribes dotted all over South London, from Erith across to Morden. Um, I therefore decided that um, as I joined Kibbo Kift and left the Scouts that I would set up my own lodge, Kibbo Kift Lodge, which I did. And um, uh, very successful it was too. 
And then I got agitated because I thought there ought to be an organization, a local association, which we called in those days a thing, a broccoli thing, I think we wanted to call it, a thing, uh, to bring all these South London cooperative groups together. Mark, I was only 16. I was, I, was pretty, I was pretty, as I say, precocious in all these things. Well, we had a meeting. We had a meeting on my proposition to, to form Broccoli Thing. We held it in the old Deptford Town Hall. I don't know whether you know it, a marvelous building. Uh, and um, and the, who were present there? Well, Joe Reeves was there. A man called G.S.M. Ellis was there, who was the leader of the Wheat Chief group of, um, or Wheat Chief tribe of Kibokift, and who ultimately became uh, the Education Secretary of the National Union of Teachers. There was John Wilmot, who was a member of Kibokift and who became MP for East Lewisham and eventually Lord Wilmot, he was there. So a lot of lively young socialists and left people were there. And they um, argued on my proposition about forming a, a, a local association, and they decided they'd do it, and they promptly appointed me head man. And um, I remember Lord w Wilmot, or John Wilmot, then saying to me, go on, man, make a speech, make a speech. Well, I'd never made a speech in my life. And so I stuttered something. Anyway, we got this local association founded. And then it was discovered by John Hargrave that I was only 16 or 17, and you weren't allowed to be an adult member of the Kibbo Gift unless you were 18. So he refused to recognize the association and uh, wanted to chuck me out. However, the local association stood by, stood by me and therefore a row developed. Now, of course, the row was not really about me. It was about the fact that this these organizations, these tribes in South London were socialist or radical or cooperative. Anyway, they didn't appeal to John Hargrave, who was moving more and more to the right. So in a sense, to refuse to acknowledge the association because this schoolboy was its leader was really an excuse to get rid of the association altogether. And um, a, la a row carried on, carried on, for what it was. Two years? By the time, I, by 1924, I was, I was 18 or 19. <laughs> so in a sense, the whole row was ridiculous, nonsensical. Um, but nevertheless, the row had turned into a debate about, not about socialism so much about democracy. Was Kibbukev a democratic association, organization, and was it possible, therefore, for the members to decide the policy, or did John Hargrave decide the policy altogether? Well, we met at an All Thing. Those of you who are older members of the Woodcraft Co. remember, we had All Things too, which were open air annual assemblies, uh, democratically run and by, in which things were decided by vote. And the 1924 All Thing of Kibberkift at High Wycombe uh, proposed a vote of censure upon Hargrave, and this was defeated. And then one third of the whole movement withdrew from the council circle. And so one third of the movement, as it were, resigned from Kibbokev because he couldn't stand dictatorial tactics inside this youth movement. Uh, now, what happened after that? Well, it grows more complicated in a way. I don't really need to go on to the history of Kibbokev. Hargrave, as I said, was uh, brilliant, but was dotty. He moved the movement, his movement, into support for social credit and formed a social credit, um, almost fascist uh, youth organization dressed in green shirts and long trousers who marched about all over the place and who were really destroyed by the um, uh, Political Uniforms Act, what was it, of 1927, something like that? You remember, I think? Yes. Anyway. They're really destroyed by that. So he moved the movement into a sort of a fringe political effort which was doomed to disaster anyway. And Kibberkiff eventually destroyed itself in that way and disappeared altogether from the, uh, from the youth movement world. Now what did we do? Well, we did nothing. But this is where the Woodcraft folk begins. 
and that is that I and Sidney Shaw, among two others, we debated after this uh, business of 1924 whether all this cooperative effort in South London was going to die. Were all these very fine tribes or groups with their leaders and with their camping techniques and with their banners and everything else, were all going to go out of existence. And that's why I got together Sidney Shaw and one to others and in February of 1925 started the, the uh, Wayfarers Fellowship in Catford to carry on, as it were, the work that had already been done. And this was the basis of an entirely new movement with its own program and everything else. Uh, uh, and, well, you know something of the rest, and if you don't know anything of the rest, well, there's a, a lovely chap which is just out and which will give you far more detail than I've ever been able to give you. But the marvelous thing, let me conclude, even though I've left a lot out, is that here we are, 60 years on, all from those very humble beginnings in struggle, in strife, with older people, and we survived it. Whereas many of the others, most of the others, who were born out of, in a sense, the revulsion against the scout movement of the First World War, have disappeared. The order of Woodcraft chivalry has just about disappeared. Do you know that there were socialist Sunday schools? They have disappeared. Do you know that there were socialist Sunday school scouts? They have disappeared. Woodcraft folk goes on. Goes on, I think, triumphantly holding its own and preaching its own values and its own loyalties and going on to its 70th anniversary. That alone, in all the circumstances, without all the publicity, or wealth or, or uh, support that other organizations have had, the Woodcraft folk with its own leaders persists in this way. So my concluding words are that I salute you.